um, you know, we went through a little bit of a church transition. Nine months ago, Global Hillsong helped plant a church in the metropolitan area of Atlanta, Georgia. And Pastor Sam Collier took on the reins of lead pastor. So I reached out to a friend of mine who's actually pastor of apologetics at Hillsong Atlanta. So this is Pastor Lambert giving me the inside scoop of why Pastor Sam Collier officially resigned from Hillsong. There's been negative press surrounding Hillsong over the past two years or so. We've only been here eight months. And as a new church plan, the only equity that we really have is trust. With all of the negative press that's kind of rolling around, we can't build like this. Because it's going to be very hard to build with so many people distrusting the ministry or distrusting the leadership. And so for us, it was more about trust because we're going to have to spend the next two to three years rebuilding the reputation, the credibility, etc. There's no bad blood. You know, we love Hillsong. They've been amazing to us. We have a great relationship with them. The people's natural inclination is to pit us against each other. That's totally unwarranted. The relationship is still intact. The love is still there. We're still a family. Just had to do what was best for the ministry. That's all. Pastor Sam posted this on his Instagram. It is with great sadness that I inform you of my departure from Hillsong. I've appreciated Hillsong family. I want to thank the Houstons for the love they have shown. Tony and me, my greatest reason for stepping down as pastor of Hillsong Atlanta, it's probably not a secret to any of you, with all the documentary scandals, articles, accusations, and the church's subsequent management of these attacks, it's become too difficult to lead and grow a young church in this environment. I have no shame in admitting I cried like a baby moments after I informed the Hillsong Global Pastor of my departure. I truly love the Hillsong family and believe they will get through this storm and come out better than they were before. Join me this Sunday. Now catch this. Join me this Sunday at Center Stage, which is the venue they use, for our final service as Hillsong Atlanta. And for more info about a new church I'm planting, relaunching on Easter Sunday called Story Church. I think... Uh, that's good, and I think it's great that the Global Hillsong family isn't uh, getting in the way of this. I know quite a few people that have gone to Hillsong Atlanta in the past eight, nine months since they've started. I have quite a few friends there, and I think they're doing some good work. And so I'm happy for them, and hopefully, God willing, grow from here. I think it's a wise decision to pull back and become an autonomous church. The pastor of the Atlanta branch of Hillsong Mega Church is stepping down. This comes as the larger mega church deals with its founders' misconduct allegations. 11 Alive's Cares Belger was there for his final service as he tried to guide his congregation in a new direction. I remember where I was when I got the call. Me and my wife, Tony, were in the house and we, we were excited. We, we were excited because for us, th this was the opportunity of a lifetime. We, we had been praying about a ministry that we could help continue. We had been praying about a home that would wrap their arms around us, give us the ability to pioneer a work in a city littered with the history of slavery, the birthplace of civil rights right in Atlanta, Georgia. I've been walking with the daughter of Martin Luther King Jr. for so long, I began to dream, a dream, that maybe we could come together. And, and I got the call after six months. The founders of Hillsong wanted to meet. We have been waiting for a long time. We were excited. We, we, I had heard the songs sung in every church I had been in. I had, I've grown up in singing the songs. I, I, I'd inspired people. I had preached after some of the songs. I mean, man, this is the moment. And that was February of 2020. And then March happened, and they canceled the meeting because they couldn't get out of Australia. So we had to wait another Three months. And then we got the call again and we were re-excited. Okay, this is it. The pandemic is, is happening. 
but this is it. They, they're, they're flying in from Australia in the middle of COVID-19, but, but at this moment, it wasn't February, February anymore. It was the beginning of June, and George Floyd had just died. And they said, we're in L.A. Come on over. So me and Tony got our bags. We're excited. Also kind of depressed. And we're flying from Atlanta, Georgia, over into L.A. And we drive up to Newport Beach. And we walked in, and, and, there, and, there, they, and there they were. And we sat down with Pastors Brian and Bobby and we begin to cast a vision about the need for racial reconciliation. About the need for a multicultural movement. About the need of the church being the primary solution for the ills that we face today. I, I just had this belief that if the church can't lead the way, we have no hope. And I was excited about casting this vision because right outside of the doors in L.A. where we were meeting, uh, there were riots going on. And there were peaceful protests. And there were black and brown people and even white people in the streets marching saying enough is enough. And here we are with this global machine going, maybe we couldn't just change Atlanta. Maybe we could plant a church in the birthplace of civil rights and it could go on to change the world. And they got excited, and we got excited, and they said, why don't you come and be a Hillsong family church? And we were like, yes. And me and Tony got up from the table, and we went to the restroom. We said, we in, we in, we in, we in. And we said, now come now. We got to act like we've been here. So we went back out. Thank you. We're excited to be a part. And then Brian Houston looked me in the eyes. He said, now, let me ask you a question. How deep do you want to go? I said, what do you mean? Is this not deep? He said, well, I know you've got this vision called Story Church. And it's an incredible vision. And it's this racial reconciliation and all, and all these things. We see the need. But why don't, why don't you just become Hillsong Atlanta? And we said, we can do that. I didn't know people could get in like this. And his son is at the table. He said, people don't ever get in like this. And I said, well, okay. He said, well, go home. Go back to your hotel and think about it. I went back to the hotel. And Tony said, man, are you, can you believe it? They've invited us in. I said, they didn't invite us in. They're not serious yet. We went back to dinner that next night. And I said, so what is it going to take for y'all to be serious about this? Are y'all really trying to do this? They said, well, we're waiting on you. And Tony looked at me and said, see? <laughs> Pastor Brian said, hey, go home for two weeks and think about it. Call your mentors. Call your covering. Pray about it. And listen, what you have to understand at this time, Hillsong is on top of the world. They're on top of the world. We're excited. It's like, man, we're going to be the first African-American pastors in the Hillsong world. This is history. We can't believe it. We went home. We told our mentors, yes, do it, do it, do it, do it. Call back two weeks later. We're in. Three months go by. We get another call. They've gone back to Australia, and they say, in two weeks, we're going to make the announcement globally. First African-American pastors. We get our team together and we gather on a Saturday evening at around 8 p.m. at my house. It's about 20 of us in a living room, our initial staff, our initial volunteer corps. And we're like, here it is because Saturday at 8 p.m. in Atlanta is the morning in Australia on Sunday, and we're sitting around watching the 8 p.m. service, and the announcement comes out. And for the next seven days, People Magazine, New York Times, New York Post, Christianity Today, Christian Post, first African-American pastors, they want to do hip-hop in the service. 
and gospel in the service and CCM in the service and racial reconciliation. This is amazing. For seven days, we were on top of the world. I couldn't walk through an airport and not see my face. And then the eighth day, Carl Lentz has an affair. And the media shifts from first African-American pastors to one of the most well-known Hillsong pastors has had an affair. Justin Bieber's pastor has had a moral failure. And six months later, we were still talking about it. I remember at one time for three months, there was an article every single day. And I said to Tony, it's okay, they're going to get past this. It's 160 locations. There, there's not going to be any more. Like, we're just going to get rid of that one pastor. But there's so many other. But then another article came out about another pastor. Then another article came out. Then another article came out. And I had mentors calling me. Now, mind you, the church had not even opened. Are you okay? I said, no, no, it's, hey, they're going, it's, it's okay. We're going to get past this. It's just one. They said, well, stuff keeps coming. I, I said, well, no, it's okay. We're, we're going to open the church in two months. And in the middle of that, and it, 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 we opened the church in the middle of a scandal. 2,000 people showed up. And we were like, there is still hope. Two months later, we get called into a meeting. We planted in June. In August, we were called to a meeting in California with all of the national head pastors and international, some of them in, the, in, in Latin America. And we sat down and they said, a documentary is coming out in six months. Then I had my phone rung again. It's my mentors. Are you okay? Are, are you, are you going to, are you, I'm, I'm fine. And, and someone, that, what is it going to take for you to get out? I said, well, the Lord hasn't released me yet. The Lord hasn't released me. They said, well, we want you to pray about this. We want you to pray about what it's going to take. And I hung up the phone and started praying, and the voice of the Lord said to me, you leave when I tell you to leave. When you can no longer fulfill the vision of racial reconciliation, when you can no longer fulfill what I've put on your life and in your heart, that is the moment you leave. So we waited another six months. And our founder resigned. And we thought, well, maybe he'll go on a break. In two more months, another article came out. And donors started leaving. And I remember the Sunday that some of my donors, if not the largest ones, came up to me and said, listen, we love you. We love the vision. We can't do it. If you stay, we, and then I started running into people at the mall. You know when you go to the mall or the grocery store as a pastor in your city and you start seeing people. And they're like, Pastor, oh, Pastor, we love you. Hey, we're out. We love you, but we can't. We can't do this. And before me, my dreams are shattering. And I'm calling my mentors, and I said, I, I think, I think I got to go. Interestingly enough, Joseph was one of those people I called, he, and a friend, and he said, you, you hung in there a long time. You hung in there a long time. I got up Monday, 
and uh, send an email. We talked to our board of directors or our leadership at the time, and they said, well, what are we going to do with all these people? And decided that we should do our best to take care of them. And we got back up that next Sunday after making the announcement on social and said to the church, you've seen the announcement, you've gotten our emails, you see where we're going. You don't have to go with us. We know it's been a hard year for you. Can we, let's put seven churches on the screen that are great churches. Go to this church, go to this church, go to this church. But, but if, if you want to stay with us as we navigate into this new journey, two weeks later on Easter, we're going to relaunch. And then we took two weeks off. Now, listen, I, I want to talk to you about the two weeks. Because I, I don't know if you're like me, but when you are running and carrying a lot, I kind of click in the autopilot and I don't realize how much is on my shoulders. I, I don't know if you're like that. And I realized I had been running for a year and almost a half just carrying and carrying and carrying and carrying. And all of a sudden when, when I pressed pause, it, the weight hit me. And Tony looked at me and said, you don't have to do this. You don't have to do this. I don't even know if you're happy. And I, and I made a mistake of Googling my name. And I remember one headline, I won't give you the outline. They had my face, and it says, Hillsong Pastor has a scandal. And then my phone started ringing that week. Hey, what scandal? Did you have a scandal? What happened? Are you okay? I'm like, no, I didn't have the scandal. Somebody, I, somebody else had the scandal, and I had to, here, watch this video. You'll understand. And people kept... And then I, I, I was on Facebook and people were saying, Sam Collier had a scandal. And I'm, and, and I'm looking at Tony and I said, I, you know, we, I spent the last 10 years building a life. And by association, I'm losing every. And you know, when, when a church goes through a scandal, you know, it's almost impossible to shield anybody from trauma. So now trauma is running through the leadership, and people are talking about me. Anybody ever been talked about by a member? <laughs> I remember seven days <laughs> into the two-week transition, it was called heretical. They said I had a scandal. And I think I was going into a depression. And I said to myself and my wife, maybe, maybe I should just quit. I didn't sign up for this. Maybe I should just, I, I don't need this. And, and Tony was right there with me in the motion. She said, yeah, baby, you don't need this. We don't need this. I said, well, I don't need this. I don't need this. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't sign up for the pressure. I didn't sign up to be talked about. I didn't sign up to be the headline. And as I'm sulking, I click on YouTube. And an interview pops up with Bishop T.D. Jakes and Stephen Furtick. Can we put that picture up on the screen. And it's not the entire interview. It's just a portion of it. It's like three minutes of the interview. And I'm sitting on the couch depressed. Seven days out from a relaunch. And I click play on the video. And Bishop Jake says, can I tell you a secret? And Pastor Furtick said, yes, yes. He said, I almost quit. And the room was silent. He said, I almost quit. He said, you know, when I started off in ministry, I started off in a small town in Virginia. It was 20 people going to my church. 
I'm, 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 I'm a small town boy. And as I began to progress in, in ministry, um, I, I, I started getting a little fame. And, and I wasn't trying to be famous. I was just trying to be effective. And the fame came as a byproduct. But as the fame came and as Woman Thou Art Loose started to explode, I started getting attacked. He said, and I didn't like it. I, I didn't like what it came with fame. I didn't, I didn't like what was happening as my, as my church continued to grow. I didn't, I, didn't, I didn't like it. He said, because I don't, I don't need it. I came from a small town. I don't need to be famous. I, I just want to help people. I didn't want what came with being effective. I didn't want what came with making the decision. And he said, so I'm, so I'm, so I'm on the road and and I'm preaching to arenas, and I'm going back to my hotel room depressed. I'm preaching in my church, and I'm going back to the home depressed. And he said, and one day, I went to a city, and I didn't want to be depressed because I felt like it might be going down the wrong road. And so instead of going back to the hotel, I went to the green room instead just so I could be around other pastors so I wouldn't do something. And so he says, I went to the green room, and as I'm sitting in the green room, a woman comes and is waiting for, I remember it like it was yesterday where I was sitting on the couch. A woman came and was waiting on me at the green room and said, hey, can I see Bishop Jays? And he said, I didn't want to talk to her. You know how it is when you're in church and you're like, oh, my gosh, this woman is. And he said, so I tried to wait her out. And two hours later, she was still standing there. He said, so I went outside and I talked to her and he said, it was this little woman around 70 years old, shriveled up. And he said, and she looked at him and she said, I've been sick. She said, I almost, I've been in the hospital for almost a year and I've almost, I almost died. And the only thing that kept me was your preaching. The only thing that made me get up and fight was your message. The only thing that saved my life was watching you. She, he says, and then she looks at me in the eyes and she says, it's not for them. It's for us. And I broke down crying on the couch and I heard the spirit of the Lord say to me it's not for them it's not for them it's, it's for the people that I've called you to I know you, you want to give up, and I know you didn't ask for the headline, and I know you didn't ask for the scandal, but you're not doing this for them. You're doing this. I need you to stay in for the ones that I've called you to. There's somebody waiting on your message. There's somebody waiting on your faithfulness. There's somebody waiting on you to show up and hang in there. It's not for them. It's for the people I've called you to. That, that's who it's for. That's, that's why you can get up and walk another day. That's why you can hang in no matter what the pressure has been. Now, you can stand up again because I've called you to a people. And I just, I just want to talk to somebody before I get to a scripture and say, um, I don't know who's going through something. I don't know what pressure you're under. I don't know who talked about you. I don't know what, what member uh, treated you bad, what leader did you wrong, what, what trauma you have, who's not showing up to the church. But I want to say to you, it's not for them. It's not for the people that's talking about you. It's not for the people that aren't there. You got to stay faithful. You got to hang in there for the people that are there. 
You got to hang in there for the ones that he's called you to. You got to hang in there for your city. You got to hang in there for the broken marriages that need your words and that need you to show up. Can we all stand just for a second? And, and as we stand, I want to read this passage of scripture over you. And then I want to speak to some people. Then Jesus went with them to the olive grove called Gethsemane. And he said, sit here while I go over there to pray. He took Peter and Zebedee's two sons, James and John, and he became anguished and distressed. He told them, my soul is crushed with grief to the point of death. Stay here and keep watch with me. He went on a little further and bowed with his face to the ground, praying, my father, if it is possible, let this cup of suffering be taken away from me. Yet I want your will to be done, not mine. Then he returned to the disciples and found them asleep. He said to Peter, can you watch with me even one hour? Keep watch and pray so that you will not give in to temptation. For the spirit is willing, but the body is weak. Then Jesus left them a second time and prayed, My father, if this cup cannot be taken away unless I drink it, your will be done. When he returned to them again, he found them sleeping. For they couldn't keep their eyes open. So he went to pray a third time, saying the same things again. Then he came to the disciples and said, Go ahead and sleep. Have your rest. But look. Everybody say look. Look, the time has come. The Son of Man is betrayed into the hand of sinners. Up, let's be going. Look, my betrayer is here. What I love about this passage is that many theologians debate back and forth about what was happening with Jesus. They, and, and specifically, they debate um, how much pain and stress he was in. My favorite interpretation of this verse is what one theologian says. They says that, that, that Jesus, um, he, he was so distressed that he was sweating blood. And as I begin to read this passage through that lens and, and, and see the pressure that Jesus was under, I begin to think about myself and I begin to think about the pressure that you're under. And when I get to the end of the verse, can we put that last verse up on the screen? The part that, that always gets me is the part that says, but look, the time has come. And I often wonder, okay, Jesus, you went back and forth three times. You, you, you begged the Father to take it. You struggled. You, you knew the cross was coming. It's as if he was feeling the pain of the cross. And you asked him to take it three times. What rose up in you that allowed for you to say, look, the time has come. Look, I, I wonder, where did that confidence come from? Where did that fortitude come from? And if I could just give you the Sam Collier version. I believe that maybe Jesus, as he's sweating blood, maybe he saw you. And, and maybe... He saw me, and I just imagine this, that he's sweating blood, and, and we're on our knees looking up as, as he's struggling, and we're saying, it's for us. It's, it's for us. 
It's for us. And, and, and as we continue to say it's, it's for us, I just believe a confidence and a fortitude and a strength rose up in him that allowed for him to say, well, whatever I have to do, I'm going to do it because it's for them. When we transitioned from Hillsong to Story, we lost 20% of our membership and we had a 50% staff turnover. It was hard for about three months. We, we just continued to plow and we continued to plow and we continued to believe and we continued to fight for the ones that God called us to. And about six months after we reopened the Story Church, we were up by 60% past where we were when we were Hillsong. We were making more money than we had made when we were Hillsong. And, and last Sunday, we ran out of chairs. And I heard the Lord say, it's not for them. It's not for them. It's for the people I've called you to. So in a moment, I, I want to invite some people down and I want to pray over you. And, and the people I want to invite down are those people that are on the couch going, I, I'm done. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't ask for this. It's too hard. People are talking about me. People are lying on me. My family is, has, been, has been threatened because of the work of the ministry. I'm tired of plowing the ground. I don't have any more in me. I think there's somebody in the room that says, I'm just, I just want to give up. I'm done. Or maybe you're just in this room and you need a strength to keep going. You need a confidence to rise up in you as you look at the people that are, that, that are looking back at you going, it's for us. This is why you've been called. You've been called for them. If that's you, I'm going to pray for you, and I believe the Lord is going to do something special in you today. I want to invite the worship team, and if that's you, come down here right now. Come down here right now. Run, run down here right now. Run down here right now. Run down here right now. Come down here right now. You need a supernatural courage to rise up on the inside of you. I'm, I'm going to pray that God would release something for you, that, that you would find a new wind, that you would see the faces. Come on, come, come here, come here, come here. That you would see the faces that God has called you to. you would see them I'm going to ask the worship team to sing and if we have any I know we do pastors in the room would you just come and touch some of them on the shoulder would you just come come down and just touch some of them on the shoulder touch some of them on the shoulder touch some of them on the shoulder and as the worship team is singing if that's you you still got time to get down here we're going to surround you and we're going to pray Let's sing a little bit and then we're going to pray. I can look in the audience and see some of you. You're feeling it. God's talking to you. You may not want to come down, but the Lord is moving. It's not too late to come. I believe God's going to do something special. If you would, would you, if you're in the audience, would you take your hand and just place it on the shoulder of somebody next to you? You never know what they're going through. You never know where they stand. And for just two minutes, let's pray for one another as we pray for those at the altar. God, I pray for those at the altar and those that are in the audience and those watching online, that they would find the strength to go on another day. 
that the tears would be redeemed. Thank you, Jesus. That the pain would have a purpose. That they'd have the strength to take just another step. That they'd see the remnant that you've called them to looking at them as the world comes down against them saying it's for us it's for us it's for us and I pray that the same courage that rose in Jesus in the garden that, that would allow for him to go to the cross that it would be a courage and a fortitude that would rise up in them right now that it would rise up in them right now that the spirit would give them a supernatural strength to go on that they would not leave this place like they came but that they would be renewed that this would be a sign to keep going 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 to take another step to put one foot in front of the other i pray that they would know that you're faithful And that if they do not grow weary in well-doing, that you will fulfill the promise that you be with them to finish the race. I pray even in this moment that all of us would see one person that you've called us to that's been impacted by the ministry that you've placed in our hands and I pray that that one person would inspire us to continue another day we love you we praise you in Jesus name Amen